So we are looking at chapter four, and this is the ninth exercise in our set, which is exercise 12. We are asked to prepare a balance sheet given all of the accounts that are listed there. This is a classified balance sheet. So rather than being a simple balance sheet where we just list all of our assets from most to least liquid just in, an, in a row, and then list all of our liabilities, we're actually going to be separating them into more useful categories. And so we have a current assets category and a property plant and equipment category. We have a current liabilities category. Now this, this example doesn't have any long-term liabilities, but if they did, that would come right in here between the current liabilities before we have the total liabilities. And the question we are asked to find is what is the correct balance in that cash account? So with what we know about the relationship on the balance sheet, what, how are we going to find that? What do we know? What's the fundamental accounting equation? Well, we could have to make them equal. So it's gonna have uh, assets equal stockholders equity plus liabilities. That is correct. And so if we know everything, we're using the fundamental accounting equation. And if we know that our total assets must be equal to our total liabilities and equity, we're going to be able to do a, a simple calculation to find what cash must be to make that true. So we're going to start, we'll just go from the top down. And as we encounter each account, as we look at each account, we'll, we'll answer the question about what type of account is this? And then we'll know where to put it on the balance sheet. So we'll start with accounts payable. What type of account is accounts payable? Liability. It is a liability. And we know that, that we only have current liabilities because of the way they have the template set up. But under normal circumstances, you would have to answer that question about, well, is this current or long-term? Or another word for long-term liability is a non-current liability. Our distinction, as we learned last week or last class, the difference between a current and a non-current or long-term liability is both when is it going to be due? So in order to be a current liability, it has to be due and payable within one year or the normal operating cycle, whichever is longer. And we also need to be planning to pay it using our current assets. And so accounts payable represent the amounts that we owe to our suppliers. We bought maybe some inventory or supplies from our supplier. We bought it on credit. Almost certainly our supplier is not going to be willing to wait more than one year for us to make that payment. And so that's how we know it's a current liability. The next account we have is accounts receivable. Accounts receivable are really the opposite of accounts payable. So we've allowed a customer to buy from us on credit and will the customer will pay us you know, at some point in the future, whatever date we agreed upon, maybe it's 30 days or 90 days, we'll be talking more about payment terms in an upcoming chapter. So accounts receivable would be what type of account? An asset. <laughs> it is an asset. Is it a current asset or is it part of property, plant, and equipment? Current. Current. So we know that our current assets are going to be listed in order from most to least liquid. So I'm not going to put it on the top line because I'm going to eventually put the cash balance there. So I'm just going to skip the top line and, and put this on the second line for accounts receivable. Next, we have accumulated depreciation on the equipment. Well, if we have accumulated depreciation on the equipment, we must also have some equipment. And if we scroll down, you can see that we do have an equipment account. I don't think we've looked at this yet, 
but it would, um, but normally land, if we have land, land would be listed first. And we do have a land account. So I'm just going to put the title of the account in there as a placeholder. We'll put in the dollar amount when we get down to that point. We did see this in an earlier exercise that the way we display our um, long-term depreciable assets so in this case, that would be the equipment. We list the equipment first and the dollar amount we enter is the full historical cost. That is, what did we pay for this equipment all in when we acquired it? And then the accumulated depreciation is the value that we have already reported as expense during the lifetime of that asset since we started using it in the running of our business. And then the next line is the book value. So in another word for that is carrying value. I'm pretty sure I've given you that term before as well. So the book value or carrying value of the equipment is the value that is left. So when we get to the equipment account, we'll fill that in as well. But for now, I'm just going to put in the accumulated depreciation because I want to keep us in order here. We know that we don't know the balance in the cash account yet, but we know how we're going to find it when we get there. The next account is common stock. Where is that going to go? Common stock is what type of an account? Stockholder equity. It is a stockholder's equity, and that is the contributed capital account. That is the value that was put into the company as an investment at the time that stock was originally issued. And I'm being careful about the way I phrase that. I don't wanna say it, the stock was sold because sometimes we might exchange stock for some other asset. So maybe someone wants to put a, um, you know, a building that they have, they want to, to give that building to the company in exchange for some stock. So it was sold, but not for cash. So this stock, um, when it was issued, was issued in exchange for $100,000 worth of assets. And it could be cash, but it also could include other assets that are being contributed to the business, hence the name contributed capital. When we get to our stockholders equity chapter, which is later in the, in the book, I think it's chapter 12, we will be talking more about that. After common stock, we have equipment. So we can put that balance in now. And then we can find the book value. So we originally paid $325,900 for that equipment. And We've been using it for a while. During the time that we've used it, we have reported $186,000 worth of expense associated with the use of that equipment. And so the book value is the difference between the original or historical cost and the accumulated depreciation. And you'll notice where we enter that is in line under the land so that we'll be able to total those once we have the value for the land. And next we have the land. So the land had an original or historical cost of 375,000. We're going to add that to the book or carrying value for the equipment to find the total PP and E property plant and equipment. I've pointed this out before, but I'd like you to notice again that in the formatting, we have a dollar sign at the top of the column, but we don't need another dollar sign for anything that's underneath that until we take a total. So when you see this bar representing, we're going to do some math here, then you use a dollar sign after that. The grand total, the, the final total, we're not gonna do anything more with that, you'll notice has a double accounting underline under that. So how did you get the 514,900? Yep, good question. So 
That's the total for the property, plant, and equipment. And what I added together was the value of the land and this book value of the equipment. Make sense? As I pointed yep. out to you, oh, yep, thank you. As I pointed out to you on Monday, when you are looking at the company that you chose for your project, when you look at their financial statements, their balance sheet is going to be a comparative balance sheet so that they'll have at least two years and, and probably three years worth of data side by side. And each year only takes up one column. So these two items here, equipment and accumulated depreciation for the equipment could easily just be smushed over here into this column. And these totals could be smushed over here so that everything was just in one column. The only reason we present it like this in the three column approach is because we're only looking at one year and it kind of makes it easier for us to focus on, you know, over here on the right are the totals. These are the big picture numbers that we need. And to the left of that is more of the detail stuff. So it doesn't need to be set up this way. It could all be in one column, but because we're only looking at one year, we tend to spread things out to make it a little bit more useful in terms of being able to highlight where are the totals and where's the detail, the subtotal stuff. Okay. Any other questions before we keep going? Okay, so next we have prepaid insurance and prepaid rent. And those are what type of accounts? Current asset. They are current assets. They're assets because it's something that's going to benefit our business. We now have this insurance policy providing us some protection over the next, I don't know, coming months or year. And the rent, we now have the right to use whatever space that is that we're renting over the coming period. Again, it could be you know months or years. They're current assets because we've made these payments for the current operating cycle. And so it's not likely we've paid our rent more than one year in advance or we've paid an insurance policy for more than one year. And I am going to skip a line and only because I know that this is where they're going to go. Otherwise we would have to look at what else is there that we need to include here. And there is one more account that's going to go under current assets. We can tell because of the way that the template is set up for us. And I'm just telling you, because I've looked ahead, that I know that it's going to go above these two prepaid accounts. Next, we have salaries payable. What type of account is that? Anybody? Liability. It is a liability. And again, we only have current liabilities in our template. So we know that's where it's going to go. But we also know just from common sense, our employees are not likely going to wait for more than one year for us to pay them what they have earned. And so we're listing that under current liabilities. And then the next item is supplies and that of course is the one that we are missing here under current assets and then we have our unearned fees that's the unearned revenue account and where is that going to go current liabilities current liabilities And we can total those. And I skipped over retained earnings. 
So one more, let's go back up to that. It was not intentional. Retained earnings. We only have one line left, but we know that retained earnings is the other piece of the permanent stockholders equity account. And so when we add together our common stock and retained earnings, that gives us our total stockholders equity. We can add that to our liabilities to get the total liabilities plus stockholders equity. We know because of the fundamental accounting equation that whatever our total liabilities and equity equal must be the same as our total assets because that's what the equation tells us here. Now, what are we going to do? Subtract 514,000 from 800,000. And then I'll have to exactly that from the current assets. Yes. So we know that the total assets are 800,000. And of that amount, 514,900 is the property, plant, and equipment. So if we subtract, then the 285,100 must be our total current assets. And then what's our last step? How are we going to find our cash from there? Anybody come up with a number? Seventy-two thousand. Seventy-two thousand. I did that wrong. Never mind. You didn't do it wrong because that's the correct number. So where does that seventy-two thousand come from? Well, we know our total current assets is two hundred eighty-five thousand one hundred, and we know the balance for every one of them other than the cash account. So if we take that total two eighty-five one and subtract from each of these other balances, accounts receivable, supplies, prepaid insurance and rent, whatever's left, which is the 72,000, is must be the balance in the cash account. That's the only way to make this balance sheet balance. That is our total assets must be equal to the liabilities and equity. So how did you get the 800,000 again? So down here in the, the total liabilities and stockholders equity, I added together, let me pull up my, yeah. So I added together this number and this number. So it's the total liabilities plus the total equity equals 800,000. Then because of the accounting equation, the total assets must be the same as that total liabilities and stockholders equity combined. So the 800,000 that I got down here at the bottom I simply transferred up here and said, I know that number has to be the same. Makes sense. And then just to, to repeat how we went from there, we then subtracted the total property plant and equipment to get this number, the total current assets. And then we subtracted each one of these 
to get the missing piece, which was this cash balance. And I'm going to go ahead and click check my work just so we can get the green check mark on there. Any other questions about this exercise? So the values don't have to be in order from least or greatest to least. That was just for the last exercise. So that was the right. So that was the expenses on the income statement that we said that the accounts should be listed from largest balance to smallest other than miscellaneous expense. Okay. All right. So on the on the balance sheet, what's more important is which category they go in. And so our assets are going to be listed from most liquid that is closest to cash down to least liquid, which are the things that are going to be used up later. And that's why property, plant, and equipment comes after the, as the current assets. Okay. The same thing is true in the liability section that we would have our current liabilities listed and then our long-term liabilities listed after that if we had any, which we don't in this exercise. Okay. Yeah, good question. Let me clear my drawings and we'll go on to our last exercise for this chapter. And in this exercise, they give us a balance sheet, but they tell us that there are some problems for, with the balance sheet. And the first thing that I would look at to see, well, how do we know there's a problem? Actually doesn't give us any hints because this number, the total assets, does equal the total liabilities and equity. That's the first thing I would look for is, are those two numbers the same? And in this case, they are the same, but it's pure coincidence because we're told there's something wrong with this balance sheet. And so what they're asking us to do is recreate this balance sheet ourselves and, and get things in the correct location. And so we are given down here at the bottom, a template to prepare the classified balance sheet where we have our current assets, our property, plant and equipment, our current liabilities, and then our stockholders equity. And so what I would like to do is allow you a few minutes to try this on your own and see if you can identify which accounts are in the wrong place. As before, I'm going to do mine on my own also. I'm going to pause the recording and let you work on yours. Once you're done, you can check yours against mine and we will resume the recording at that time. So looking at our completed exercise, um, I think it's very interesting what they had done with using the, the fudge factor, if you will, of the net income to make it balanced. So they added net income into the, the current liability section. Obviously net income would not be a current liability, but that was how they made it balanced as we pointed out on the given information that the total assets were equal to the total liabilities and equity, which is the first thing I would have checked. But you can see that as we, oops, that one. As we, as we finished up, we have our total assets here of 625,000 which matches our total liabilities and stockholders equity of 625,000. This is the first time that we had multiple property, plant and equipment that were depreciable assets. And so we're adding together our land, the book value of the building and the equipment to get the total of our property, plant and equipment. 
and we add that to our total current assets to get the total assets. And finally, we have just the two current liabilities that we add together, combine that with the two permanent equity accounts and it matches. Any questions on that? Okay. So as I said, I neglected to start the, the recording when we started class today. So we're going to take just a brief break here if you need to, to step away from the computer for a moment. I'm going to take a couple minutes just to look at those first two exercises that we did together and summarize those for people who might be watching this recording later. And then we will be moving on to chapter five. So let's take maybe a 10 minute break. We'll come back at 9.20. And if you need to, you can drop off the Zoom call if you need to, or stay on and just do your own thing until 9.20. And for people who missed the first two exercises when I was not taping, let me go back and take a look at those. So in the first exercise, we were talking about the steps in the accounting cycle. And your job for this exercise is to put them in the order that they would happen. So the typical accounting period is a month. And most of that accounting cycle is taken up with simply recording transactions as they occur. A transaction is anything that affects the financial position of the company. And the way we do that is by first journalizing. So first we journalize the transaction. And so that is here in, in number or letter I is the first thing that happens. We record any transaction that happens in the journal. And then we post those transactions from the journal to the ledger. At the end of the period then, so we've gone through the entire month just recording transactions as they occur. And then we prepare the unadjusted trial balance and we look at that to see what's missing, what's not on this adjusted unadjusted trial balance that should be there, and what's there that maybe shouldn't be there. We gather the data that we need to be able to do our adjustments, and sometimes under some circumstances or for some organizations that are more paper and pencil, they may prepare an end of period spreadsheet. That end of period spreadsheet we saw in one of the exercises that we did during the last class where we have the six columns, two that are the unadjusted trial balance, debit and credit. The next two are the adjustments. And then the last two are the adjusted trial balance totals. Once we have identified what all those adjustments are going to be, we're going to actually do the adjustments and then prepare the adjusted trial balance. Once we have that adjusted trial balance, we can prepare our financial statements. We do our closing entries, which again, we saw in our last class how to do those closing entries, which means we are zeroing out all of the temporary accounts, that is dividends, revenues, and expenses are going to be zeroed out. And once we have zeroed out, and moved all of that temporary information, the dividends and our income into retained earnings. We then prepare a post-closing trial balance to confirm that all of our nominal or temporary accounts have been zeroed out. And then we're ready to start for the next period with only the permanent accounts, the assets, liabilities, and the permanent equity accounts with a balance in there. Those balances become the beginning balance for the next period. And we start again with this whole cycle of recording transactions that happen during the next month. And the second exercise that we did together this morning before I started the recording is just to put together an income statement. 
using the data that are provided. Now we have already learned in a previous exercise that whenever we do an income statement, we want to list the expenses from the highest balance to the lowest balance, with the exception of this miscellaneous expense, which should always be listed last. That's not just one single expense, that's maybe a bunch of things that have been combined together because they don't happen frequently enough and are not a high enough dollar amount that we need to have a separate account for those various pieces that go into that. And so we always put that miscellaneous account last, but the rest of the expenses should be in order of highest dollar amount to lowest dollar amount. That is most to least significant in terms of the operation of our business. And for this particular company, unfortunately, what we saw was that their revenues were less than their total expenses. And so they have a net loss of almost $50,000. And that is the end of our discussion for chapter four.